I'm Ben Arthur, and this is Songwriter, a podcast of musicians performing brand new songs written in response to stories. Today's episode features a song by Alyssa Lecoque of the band Kodachrome. But first, we have a story written and read by one of the kings of modern day satire. Hi, I'm Gary Steingart. I'm the author of a bunch of books. I'm a book writer. I, I love books. I read them, I write them, and I love it when people set them to music. Gary's books include the novels Absurdistan, The Russian Debutante's Handbook, and Super Sad True Love Story, and the memoir Little Failure. I asked if Gary listened to music while he writes his books. When I write, I usually put on music without words because words interfere with the words I'm trying to create. So there's a lot of Kraftwerk going on, although well, Kraftwerk does have words, but rendered with a German accent, they just bounce right off me. <laughs> we are the robots. That doesn't really, I'm not going to start writing about robots after hearing that. I wondered if Gary had any expectations about the song that Alyssa would be performing that evening, but he very wisely avoided the question. The idea that there's a musical response is absolutely perfect. It becomes really a celebration of two different kinds of art. Gary's new novel, Lake Success, examines the flame-out and subsequent freak-out of hedge fund manager Barry Cohen during the days leading up to the election of 2016. He reads it at the Union Square Barnes & Noble in front of a live audience in New York City. Oh, stop, please, thank you. Around 2012, I decided that my next novel should be about finance. So I realized pretty early on in my research that people in finance often had a different view of reality than most of the people that I'd previously known. Um, an older currency trader at a massive bank uh, complained to me of the struggles of the middle class. And I said, yeah, I agree. I mean, I'm, I'm struggling, yeah, yeah. And so I asked him, but how do you define the middle class? And he said, well, just basically people like myself. You know, people struggling, people earning between two and four million dollars a year. <laughs> so when it came time to cobble together a character like Barry Cohen, who makes a lot more than four million dollars a year, uh, I kept thinking back to all the wonderful and deluded people I'd met along the way. So I'm going to read you a chapter from Lake Success to introduce you to Barry Cohen. And this scene is set in Atlanta. It's about midway through the book, and Barry gets off the bus in the middle of his journey and visits his protege, Jeff Park, whom he actually fired from his hedge fund at one point. Uh, he's also almost run out of money. He's left New York with nothing but a rollerboard full of watches, which he collects. And he also had to get rid of his uh, credit cards for complicated reasons. So he's in Atlanta to beg Jeff Park for a little bit of a bridge loan to fund his Greyhound ride across the country. Jeff Park's living room was as palatial as the entrance to a modest New York museum. Enormous golden lights hung from the ceilings, which were at least 20 feet in height. Jeff had a full head of hair, gums that didn't recede, and he did push-ups in the middle of the day. He had gone to Cornell, but had not played lacrosse like most of the guys in Barry's fund. So what's up, Barry, Jeff said, just passing through, decided to look me up. They were sitting in Jeff's kitchen. He had brought out a bottle of Yamazaki 20-year and was serving it straight up, quite decadent for 1.27 p.m. What the hell did Jeff Park do for a living? He had cashed out of Barry's hedge fund with zero. All of this is going to sound crazy, Barry said. Uh-huh. I'm on a journey, a journey by bus. Barry knew he would eventually have to explain his flight from New York to people in his tax bracket. He knew that news of his meltdown would immediately form the latest bulletin in the incestuous, bloodthirsty world from which he had sprung. But he doubted it would really surprise anyone. The people in his world could be nuts. One fund was essentially a cult with its own Bible, ritual mind control, and feats of strength. <laughs> One fellow at another fund, a quant billionaire in, in training, played piano at a third-rate bar while passing around a tip jar. Like your first ankle monitor bracelet or your fourth divorce, the occasional break with reality was an important part of any hedge fund titan's biography. The things I've seen, Barry said, and he told Jeff a few of his Greyhound adventures so far. Jeff Park seemed interested. He poured more drinks, although he insisted Barry chase his with water. It sounds a little bit like you're doing a middle-aged version of On the Road, Jeff said. Like that one-eyed Mexican dude in Jersey you said fell asleep on your shoulder? That's pretty Kerouac. That's exactly right, Barry said. Oh, no wonder he had picked Jeff Park to host him. The man had literary sensibilities beyond most of his colleagues. They really did a good job of educating up at Cornell. <laughs> I used to take the Greyhound to visit my uncle's family in Savannah, Jeff said. Everyone there looked at us like we were freaks. Everyone looks at me like I'm a freak. 
you kind of are a freak, Barry. <laughs> Barry took that as the highest of compliments. He was bonding with his former employee, uh, whom he had fired. They were going to be friends. Are you from around here originally, he asked. Yeah, I moved back down to take care of my parents. Your parents are, I want to say, from China. Close enough, Jeff Park said. <laughs> my wife is Indian, Barry said. Rock, Jeff said. You ought to get married, Mary said, completely forgetting that his own marriage was but a team of seven lawyers short of kaput. <laughs> his instinct to help Jeff Park was overwhelming. He remembered his wife's friend, the Asian woman from Brooklyn, uh, Tina, Lena, something like that. I threw away my cell phone, Barry said, can I check something on your computer? A laptop was provided. It had been a week since he had touched a keyboard. He brought up his wife's profile. What a gorgeous family you have, Jeff Park said, pointing at the profile photo of his wife and son. When I worked for you, I think you were just about to get married. That kid of yours, those eyes. Yeah, Barry said, his hand frozen over the keyboard. But here's what I really wanted to show you. He scrolled through the list of Seema's friends until he found the right one. Now this girl is spunky, Barry said. She called me a tool to my face. And I think she's pretty intellectual like you. Oh, one night in Brooklyn, she made these great Chinese dumplings for us. I bet your folks would love her. <laughs> Mina Kim, Jeff Park read off the screen. Ah, not really up my alley. Barry was heartbroken, but she's Chinese. <laughs> Jeff Park stared at him. I'm more into the Southern Bell type, he finally said. Ah. Barry sighed. But thanks for looking out for me. You're like that woman from Fiddler on the Roof. <laughs> Barry sort of knew what he was talking about. Matchmaker, matchmaker. Jeff Park had a wide cultural reach. <laughs> well, I'm going to make it my mission to get you married, he said. Nice guy like you. I'm not averse to the ladies, Jeff Park said. I've designed this place with them in mind. Huh. How so? Jeff Park took him on a tour, starting with a massive glass-top dining table. You see those lights, he said, pointing out a tree of Sputnik-style globes hanging over the mirrored surface. The average girl I date is five foot six, or an inch taller than the national average. I have a spreadsheet that lists the attribute of each girl I've ever dated. It's super granular. So if I'm making her dinner, and she's standing here waiting for me, talking to me, maybe having a drink, the light from these lamps is directly level with her eyes. She can see better, and I can enjoy her glow. Barry was impressed by Jeff Park's thoughtfulness. A spreadsheet. The rap on guys in finance was all wrong. They cared too much. <laughs> he knew he did. If you looked at it a certain way, he had abandoned his family because he didn't have the emotional bandwidth to accommodate their special needs. He examined an enormous couch. This sofa is the perfect height for a five foot six woman, Jeff said. When she sits down, the sofa waterfalls at the back of her knees. He invited Barry to sit down. You see, there's a gap of at least three inches between the back of your knees and the couch because you're tall. But if you were a five foot six woman, you'd be completely snug. So you only date women of that height, Barry asked? Well, there's some variance, Jeff Park said, maybe half a sigma. <laughs> I don't want the tail wagging the dog, but yeah, mostly, mostly. You're a romantic, Barry said. <laughs> Jeff Park shrugged and blushed. He was not unhandsome. His face was chiseled and tanned to perfection. The black athletic gear he was wearing made him look like a glossy seal in human form. Only the Rolex Sky Dweller on his wrist did not appeal to Barry's taste. Upstairs, Jeff had an office with a full view of Atlanta's Midtown. Barry felt a twinge of passion at the sight of a fully operating Bloomberg terminal. Jeff Park had only one screen going, which was cute. On a glass board, he had sketched out some trades that appeared exceptionally long-term and cautious, making some kind of play around Alcoa and Dow. Just scanning the numbers on the board, Barry assumed an AUM, uh, assets under management, of 35 million, which in the best of worlds brought in, what, a couple million a year? <laughs> he probably had a net of 10, 15, and he could live on that and be happy and buy couches that waterfalled the legs of median women. I trade maybe two hours in the morning, Jeff Park said, and then I spend the rest of the day working on myself. I read at least 100 books a year, and if I'm at, let's say, 70 books in November, I'll take the rest of the year off to catch up. I like reading books of the girls I date. Beckett plays, Chekhov stories, Shakespeare sonnets. Believe me, they need culture around these parts. 
Wonderful, just wonderful, Barry said. This is what I'm talking about, real self-improvement, a vocation and an avocation. So many guys say, I want to die at my peak net worth, Jeff Park said, but not me. Clearly not, Barry said. Jeff now let, led him into a bathroom. They were looking at the double mirrors that functioned as TVs in the rain shower tub. The GOP convention in Cleveland was in full blaze. Ted Cruz was saying he would not be voting for Hillary, but he wasn't going to endorse Trump either. I used to stay at the Trump Hotel at Columbus Circle whenever I visited New York, Jeff Park said. Never again. I'm a moderate Republican, Barry said. Socially liberal. <laughs> I'm on a greyhound, for Christ's sake. <laughs> they went downstairs for a new course of drink. Jeff Park was making them with ruby red vodka and Seagram soda now. They sat at a table made from the cross section of a giant tree. Its height was also designed to seduce an average woman. Barry felt around the serrated bark of the edges. He liked his furniture slightly rustic with hints of the arts and craft movement. That was supposed to be the motif of the Rhinebeck house if he ever finished it. So who made this, Barry asked. Ah, uh, that's a Japanese eucalypti, Jeff Park said. I bought it in Kokura. It reminds me of how lucky I am. Kokura, Barry said. Yeah, you never heard of the luck of Kokura? Barry shook his head. Um, it was August 9th, 1945. Uh, an American bomber was headed to bomb Kokura, right? Which is on the island of Tinian, I think, in Japan. But there was too much cloud cover over the city today, so the plane was diverted to Nagasaki. Wow, Barry said. Lucky for Kokura. Yeah, right, luck. Like if I was born in Bangladesh, let's say to, I don't know, a family of rag pickers, would any of this happen? He gestured at his 4,500 square feet of property. My mother worked as a maid in Buckhead when they got here. I still remember the food stamps with the drawings of the old whitey signing the Declaration of Independence. I memorized the words on it, US Department of Agriculture Food Coupon. Where else could a maid's son end up like this? That's why I'll always take care of my folks, why I'll always live in the same town as them. I've got to honor the luck that was given me. Barry thought of his own relationship with his parents. His, ma his mother had died in a car accident when he was five, but he had bought out his father's swimming pool company for four million, about 10 times what it was worth, so that his dad could finally retire. But after that gesture, and after his father's openly racist behavior at his wedding, he mostly avoided the old man. He went out just once to La Jolla, California, where his father was living with his girlfriend, Netta, whom he had found in an online Zionist forum. <laughs> Netta was a former social worker and had two grown kids in LA. The moment she met him, she pressed Barry into her freckled decolletage and proceeded to give him a detailed tour of her beautiful garden where she and Barry's father spent most of their time drinking coffee and looking at their laptops. Her house was a 1940s U-shaped ranch with back-to-back -back fireplaces, wild beehives in the pepper trees, little gardens of shiso leaf and miniature roses, two box turtles and a rabbit named Sylvester. There were plums that Netta's kids used to throw on the street to watch them get run over, and blood orange shrubs in the front yard, and in the middle of what even the Holy Bible would have to acknowledge to be the true Garden of Eden, sat two elderly people in their Make America Great Again caps, silently scrolling through the latest outrage to their common gene pool in the dusty hills and valleys of another land. I'm so sorry about your son getting autism, Netta had said. Did you give him vaccines? I'm sure that's what did it. I told him not to get the vaccines, his father hollered from his perch beneath a plum tree. I sent him the link about how the Somalian Muslims were spreading it through their doctors in Minnesota. Barry was out of there in less than 36 hours. Eight months later, his father was dead of pancreatic cancer. Maybe Jeff Park was just a better son, and maybe better sons made for better people. And that was why their moms didn't die in car accidents, their faces caked in blood. But that's not luck, Barry said, returning to the theme of the conversation. Sure, it's helpful not to be born to, I don't know, rag pickers in Bangladesh, but mostly your success was a result of your own hard work and your parents' gumption to move here. You don't consider yourself lucky, Jeff Park said? <laughs> not for a minute, Barry said. I never had any advantages. I wasn't even lucky enough to be born an immigrant. Jeff Park laughed. Now, that's funny, he said. So now we're going to skip ahead just a little bit toward the end of the chapter. Now, a lot has happened. Uh, Barry and Jeff's bromance has truly grown. Uh, they've compared their watch collections, which is what people in their world do when they really like one another. 
They've been all over Atlanta, and the previous night, the two of them went to Buckhead, which is a wealthy suburb of Atlanta, to watch the GOP convention in Cleveland. Uh, after their wild night out, Barry put his hand on Jeff Park's shoulder in a very ambiguous way on the ride home, and this leads to all sorts of problems between them the following day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh, and one thing about this part, uh, Barry's being investigated by the government for trades on two companies, Value Pro, Value Pro and Gastrolux. I love that name. Um, and both have hiked up the prices for certain medications, and Jeff Park's father happens to have been on one of those medications. It was early morning, raining. The Atlanta skyline was covered in gloom. Barry carried his sorrow before him. So I think it's time for me to shove off, he said. Jeff Park was eating nuts for breakfast and sipping on a macchiato. Okay, he said. Got to head to old El Paso, Barry said. See an old friend, an ex-girlfriend. Jeff Park smiled. Props, he said. Barry set himself up on the counter. This is going to sound embarrassing, he said. I'm going to need a tiny bridge loan to get me to El Paso. I don't have access to my funds at the moment. It's complicated. <laughs> uh, maybe 2,000? I can't do that, Barry, Jeff Park said. That hurt Barry right away. Why not? You've accommodated me for this long. This is uh, just a loan. You're welcome to my house, always, but I can't stake you. Who's talking stake, Barry said? $2,000, that's 4% of the cost of your Rolex Sky Dweller. Uh, I feel like I'm getting mixed signals from you. Jeff Park looked down at his lap. You fired me, Barry, he said. Ah, so there it was, finally. It wasn't me, Barry said. It was uh, Akash Singh. Everything that fun happens because of Akash Singh. I'm just the figurehead. You were there. You invited me out to breakfast at Castle Lever. And when I got there, it was just you and the lawyer. What did the lawyer say? I'm afraid we're going to have to part ways. But that's how it's done. That's just the legal way. You didn't say one word, Jeff said. I wasn't allowed to say one word. And I thought of you as something like a mentor almost. Barry sighed. I'm in genuine pain, he said, so much of the time. Doesn't that deserve something? Attention must be paid, Jeff Park said. What? Death of a salesman. Not right now, Barry said. <laughs> I wish you'd been straight with me, Jeff Park said. What do you mean? You don't have any credit cards. You don't have a cell phone. You travel on a bus where you can pay for the tickets in cash. Is it that Gastrolux trade? I mean, have you been subpoenaed? Are they after you? Did you get your Wells notice yet? I didn't do anything wrong, Barry said. It's a witch hunt. The government is after anyone who makes money, anyone who has friends. My father used hydroandatone, Jeff said. The diuretic, frankly, you can't live without it. I, I don't follow, Barry said. Value pro. Huh? A month's supply went from 30 bucks to 700 as soon as Value Pro, of which you own 20%, bought the company that made the drug. Jeff Park paused as if to let that figure register. But Barry had heard it all before. Prices went up. Shareholders profited. What part of capitalism didn't Jeff Park understand? And I've got money, Jeff said, so I got my dad covered. But that's how I think of people like you. I always have the same visualization. I start with a row of middle-class houses like the one my dad lives in, and then I see you. You go from house to house, from family to family, and you take money from their wallets, from their purses, from under their sofa cushions, and you put it in your pockets. And when your pockets are full, you put it in a duffel bag with the logo of your fund. You don't sneak in, you don't break in, you just walk amongst these people as if they're invisible, and you take the money they've earned, and then you go home, and you buy yourself a watch or whatever. You own a paddock 1018 in rose gold, Barry said. That's worth over a million. I'm not blameless, Jeff said, but I have my limits. And I know who I am. See, Barry said, that's what I'm trying to find out on this journey, who I am. Sure, Jeff Park said. And then when it's over, you can tell people about it. I'm sorry? You can tell them the story of how you once took a bus across the country. You can tell them about your journey. The Bentley entered the exciting world of Atlanta's downtown. They passed the Red Eye Bail Bonds and the Atlanta DUI Academy. A group of men had gathered outside the bus station to stare each other down with maximum malice. Be careful, Jeff Park said. This bus station has a bit of a reputation. The men outside were whooping it up about the car. Bentley, they shouted. I hope you find your five foot six inch woman, Barry said. <laughs> Jeff Park stuck out his hand and Barry shook it. You're gonna turn out better than me, Barry said. He grabbed his rollerboard and got out of the car before Jeff Park could say goodbye.
That was Gary Steingart reading a selection from his novel, Lake Success. And now we turn to the songwriter tasked with responding to Gary's book. So I'm Alyssa LeCook from the electronic duo Kodachrome. So my bandmate Ryan, um, he actually has a background in set dressing um, and art department, but um, but he's also a longtime producer. He has a hip hop background. We were both on the same label, a uh, European label out of Belgium. Um, and we did a tour together, I guess it was like eight or nine years ago at this point. And he suggested we collaborate a little bit and then we formed our band little by little. The main character in the book is pretty maddening. So uh, I guess if you're gonna have to write a song about a book, you want to have a strong feeling about it. So mad maddening counts. I have a personal experience with uh, working for a character that's similar to the protagonist in the Lake Success book, uh, narcissistic eccentric billionaire type. Just brought back, back all the memories of having to rush the hypoallergenic pillow to the hotel at midnight and, and all of that. Everybody around someone like that is somehow either employed by them or dependent on them, so you get this skewed sense of morality because it's this novelty. It's like, when are you ever again going to drink a $40,000 bottle of whiskey? I was definitely living in my like little shared apartment in the Mission District and, you know, having to sometimes drive cufflinks in the middle of the night somewhere and then come back and be like scared to park my car because it was late at night. He went through a phase where he wanted to bring birds, like a cage of birds places. So I actually still have an email from the Peninsula Hotel that says, uh, Mr. Blank has left a cage of 12 birds in his hotel room, please advise. They were finches. I gave them to the maid. I think it was really just because he could. I mean, he was claiming that they were relaxing, but I think he just kind of got off on the fact that he could do all these crazy things and just get away with it. I haven't interacted with this man since I quit, and in my mind, the narrative has played out that he's realized all of this and now has turned over a new leaf, so I'm just gonna leave it at that. Oh. Do you feel like that's true? Uh... <laughs> I hope so, I don't know. 50-50. And now, a studio recording of Alyssa Lecoq's song, Weak Wrists.
Alyssa LeCoq's Weak Wrists, written in response to Lake Success by Gary Steingart. You can check out more of Alyssa and bandmate Ryan Casey's music on Twitter, at Kodachrome Band. Please note there's no H in that. Special thanks to the kind folks at Penguin Random House for allowing us to excerpt Gary's book. Lake Success is now out in paperback, and it was just announced that HBO will be making a short series out of it, starring Jake Gyllenhaal. For the performance with Alyssa and Gary, I also wrote a song in response to Lake Success. If you'd like to hear it, you can go to songwriterpodcast.com. Thanks so much for listening to Songwriter. The next episode will feature a story from Deborah Copagan and a song written in response by Tommy Siegel of the band Jukebox the Ghost. <laughs>